And thank you, especially to our to our guests, our special guest speakers. We're gonna go ahead and get started with some introduction and remarks, and then we'll leave some time for questions. If you can use the raise hand feature, when you have a question, I'll be able to unmute you individually and then you can ask your question. Um, patience with tech is very much appreciated. The Zoom is also being recorded and we can of course follow up with folks after the call via email as well. My name is Misty Deli Carpini Tolman. I'm the Idaho State Director for Planned Parenthood Alliance Advocates and I'll be facilitating our time together today. We have joining us Rebecca Gibran, the Interim CEO for Planned Parenthood Great Northwest, Hawaii, Alaska, Indiana, Kentucky. We also have with us the plaintiff, Dr. Caitlin Gustafson, a family physician here in Idaho. And we have Carrie Flaxman, our Senior Director of Public Policy, Litigation and Law with Planned Parenthood Federation of America. So to start us off, I'm just gonna go ahead and turn some time over to Rebecca Gibran, Interim CEO of PBJIK. Rebecca? Great, thank you, Misty. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here today. As Misty said, uh, my name is Rebecca Gibran. I'm the Interim CEO for Planned Parenthood Great Northwest, Hawaii, Alaska, Indiana, and Kentucky. Our affiliate who operates Idaho's only three abortion health centers. Here to talk with you today about Idaho's newly signed six-week abortion ban, SB 1309. Idaho Senate, Idaho's Senate Bill 1309 is modeled after and off of Texas's vigilante abortion ban that allows people to sue providers who provide abortions after about six weeks. Idaho's bill differs slightly from Texas in that it allows certain relatives of the fetus to sue providers rather than the general public. But the end effect would be the same, a massive liability threat so significant that the few remaining abortion providers in Idaho would have to cease the majority of abortions. I want to note that Idaho already has two trigger bans on the books. Our opponents have been very direct, saying that 1309 is meant to stop abortions even before Roe is overturned. This ban is not meant to improve health care. It is not meant to improve patient safety. It is purely and entirely designed to circumvent and dismiss our constitutional protections and right to abortion. This bill is blatantly unconstitutional. Even Governor Little, who signed the bill into law, called the law unconstitutional and unwise in a letter to the legislature. Today, we are taking action to restore and protect Idahoans' right to abortion. We have filed a, a petition in the Idaho Supreme Court arguing that this law violates the Idaho state constitutions. We are confident in our lawsuit and have every intention that we will be able to preserve abortion rights in Idaho. I want to emphasize one point. No matter what happens in state legislatures, we remain committed to our patients in both Idaho and Kentucky. Our health centers are and will remain open. We will continue to provide critical care service, healthcare services, educational resources, and advocacy campaigns in Idaho, Kentucky, and all six of our states. This work is now more vital than ever. We want our patients to know that Planned Parenthood will always be available to them to share information, resources, and help them get the care that they need. Thank you so much for that, Rebecca. And now we'll go ahead and hear from Dr. Gustafson. Doctor. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Caitlin Gustafson. I've been practicing family medicine in Idaho for nearly two decades. What I've learned during those two decades of providing care is that life is hard, it's messy, and decisions about pregnancy are complicated and need to be made between a patient and their doctor without influence and direction from the government. As a family medicine doctor, 
I have the privilege of caring for people through some of the highs and lows of their lives. I share in the joyous occasion of caring for many patients with desired pregnancies. And I'm also there for patients and their loved ones as they contend with pregnancies that are unplanned, unintended, or have unexpected complications where they choose abortion care. These situations are as complex and varied as all of us and as unique as each of our lives. When we face difficult and painful decisions in our health, we turn to our families, our friends, our faith communities, and our physicians. I believe our elected officials shouldn't be involved in making these intimate, personal medical decisions. But Idaho lawmakers see this differently. By passing Senate Bill 1309, Idaho politicians decided to make Idahoans healthcare decisions for them. They are preventing physicians from providing patients with what is routine medical care. Instead of treating our patients, we'll be sending them to out-of-state providers. Senate Bill 1309 puts Idahoans' health and futures into the hands of politicians. This is unconscionable and unconstitutional. That's why I've joined today's lawsuit, to protect the patient-doctor relationship and access to standard medical care in Idaho. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gustafson. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to um, spend it here with us. And I know that you need to jump off the call and go attend to your patients. So um, feel free to do that when you need to. And again, thank you for being here with us. Um, now we'll go ahead and open up some time for questions uh, with Rebecca and Carrie. Again, if you could use the raise hand feature, I'll be able to um, select you individually and unmute you. Uh, I see a hand raised from Tierney. You should be able to talk. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, hi, thanks for uh, doing the call. Um, for those of us who fought, have been following the litigation around the Texas abortion ban pretty closely, can you explain to us how the petition you're filing against the Idaho law is different and why you're perhaps hopeful that this legal uh, fight will be more successful than what we've seen against the Texas law? I'd be happy to answer that. Um, uh, you know, as um, we filed, as you've you seen a petition in the Idaho Supreme Court um, uh, seeking to block the law for violating the Idaho Constitution in many, many respects. Um, and um, like the Attorney General's office has already recognized, um, Idaho law is very, very different than Texas's with respect to being able to sue the state. Under Idaho law, it is very clear that people whose constitutionally right, constitutional rights are violated, as are um, Planned Parenthood and Dr. Gustafson, and in particular, um, our patients, can go um, to court and, and sue the state. There is no sovereign immunity, to use the legal term, against, against suit in the Idaho courts. That's what the, um, the Attorney General's office already recognized in the letter to the legislature and um, is what you know really makes a difference here in terms of our ability to go to court and um, and seek for the law to be blocked. Great, thank you so much, Carrie. Um, Sarah, I see that you have a question. Um, I can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah, I had fundamentally the same question. I wonder if you could elaborate just a little bit more on what those differences are, and I mean. Just do you expect, based on your knowledge of the Idaho State Supreme Court, can you predict all what they might say? Well, what I what I can say is is you know what what is in our petition, um, which um, you know will dictate what's before the court. Plainly, SB thirteen oh nine violates the Idaho Constitution in multiple multiple respects. It was passed specifically to evade judicial review. Um, and um, a, a allow this law, um, unconstitutional law, under decades of precedent to take effect. 
And in doing that, the legislature set up um, a system that violates multiple provisions of the Idaho Constitution. You know, it violates the separation of powers um, limits in the Constitution by taking authority to enforce the law away from the executive, away from prosecutors. This is not the way laws are supposed to be enforced. It's not the way our system works. The Idaho Constitution precludes the legislature from doing that. It also violates um, equal protection rights because it completely changes the rules of litigation um, against abortion providers who can be subject to unlimited damages, um, even if the plaintiff has suffered no injury at all, ruinous um, of financial damages. That's contrary to the Equal Protection Clause um, of Idaho Constitution. All of this was laid out by the Attorney General's office in, in before the legislature passed it. And, and so, um, you know, in addition, obviously, to the, the constitutional violation of, of passing a six-week ban on abortion, abortion months before viability and contravention of precedent, the system that they created to do that um, completely upends the way law is supposed to work in unprecedented ways um, and ones that violate um, many, many provisions of the Idaho Constitution. And so we're, we're confident um, in our claims and look forward to um, getting our day in court. Yeah, and K Carrie, this is Rebecca. I would just add to that, that, you know, the constitutional violations in the law are so glaring, you know, that again, Governor Little described the law as unconstitutional and unwise um, in his letter to the legislature notifying them that nonetheless he signed it. Um, so, you know, this law sets a really da dangerous precedent uh, in Idaho. Yes, thank you, Rebecca and Carrie. And looks like we have a question from Bali. You should be unmuted now. Thanks for doing this and forgive me if this is the wrong space, but since we're here, I wanted to also just quickly ask, I know I'm sure you all saw Kentucky moving forward as well with HB3 yesterday. And I know in the past we've heard about the implications that bill could have for provision of abortion care in that state. I'm curious sort of how you're looking at that bill, what your concerns are about whether you'll be able to continue providing care if that bill does in fact become law. Yeah, I, you know, we're, um, the, the law in Kentucky just got passed yesterday. Um, we are right now looking at um, our potential legal challenges in the state of Kentucky. Um, it is a full ban on abortion. Um, so what it differs from in, you know, from Idaho, Idaho's is a six week ban, Kentucky's is a full ban. Um, and what that means is if we are unable to successfully challenge this um, in, in the court system in Kentucky, um, we will uh, be unable to comply with the law because it is a total ban and we will not be able to provide abortion care. Um, we do plan to seek, uh, you know, to pursue a legal challenge um, in the state of Kentucky um, as well. So we are working um, on that as we speak. Thank you, Rebecca. Think, oh. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the reality is that Kentucky would go completely dark. There are two abortion providers in the state of Kentucky. We are one of them. Um, and there is a, a private provider. Um, neither one of us would be able to provide abortion care to Kentuckians. So um, that state would be completely dark um, immediately um, if we are unable to successfully challenge that law. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Laura, I see you have hand up. Thank you, Misty. Um, uh, I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit about what uh, what happens next in the case? I assume you're going to look for some sort of a preliminary injunction. Injunction, you know, how quickly you think you're likely to get a hearing? Um, do you think you'll be able to kind of get something before the law goes into effect in a few weeks? Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about next steps. Uh, sure. Um, we have filed. Um, you know, our petition is to the Idaho Supreme Court. 
um, seeking a declaratory judgment that the law is unlawful and a, a, a writ directing the courts that they um, have to, you know, cannot enforce the, the law. And we're seeking that from the Idaho Supreme Court prior to April 22nd, 22nd, when it will take effect without an order from them. Um, we have, with the petition and the brief, filed a motion to expedite the proceedings so that, you know, presumably the next step is a response from the Attorney General. Um, and we've also asked for oral argument in April. Thank you, Carrie. James, I see a hand up with you. Hey, thanks, Misty. Um, so Rebecca, you said that Planned Parenthood is uh, going to help its patients regardless of if this does go into April, after April 22nd. Um, should that date come and go? I mean, how is Planned Parenthood going to help secure abortion care for Idahoans? Uh, as you pointed out in the brief, very rural state, hundreds of miles from the nearest providers in some cases. Not everyone has a car or lives near a bus station um, or can take time off work, like you said. Um, and I've seen more grassroots uh, abortion funds criticizing Planned Parenthood for um, maybe just giving a discount to people who are seeking abortions and not covering um, travel or hotel expenses. Yeah, thanks for that question, James. So, so barriers to accessing abortion and other health care um, services have always existed in Idaho. Uh, you know, as you know, challenges in finding uh, child care, taking time off of work, navigating the costs of transportation and lodging, you know, all of these things associated with already many Idahoans having to travel hundreds of miles um, to get care is now going to be um, exacerbated by out of state travel um, that will turn in, you know, from hundreds to possibly thousands of miles um, for patients who need to leave their state for an abortion. No one should have to leave their home state or their community to access basic health care. Planned Parenthood has resources available. We are partnering with our um, colleagues and partners in other states. Uh, we are actively now raising money to help support patients to get the care that they need where they need it. So what I would urge and, and want to, to assure patients is that we are here for you. We will continue to be here for you. And we are working very hard right now to create the financial resources to build those patient access fund resources to help ensure patients can get the care they need and for us to help minimize some of those financial barriers uh, for patients to, to get care out of state. Thanks, Rebecca. Susan, I see a hand up. Hi, um, thanks for the call. I'm not as familiar with uh, legal challenges in state Supreme Courts. Could you explain the universe in which this petition or lawsuit could eventually reach the US Supreme Court? Would it be if um, the state appeals any decision or just kind of lay that out for me and others who might be wondering? The state, um, we've only brought state claims in the state Supreme Court. Um, we, we don't have any federal claims. Um, the US Supreme Court does, of course, sit over all of the state and federal courts. But as we are only asserting state claims in the case, um, you know, our view is that the, this is where the case will, will end. Um, Thank you, Carrie. So far, it looks like we've called on everyone who had a hand raised. Um, so I'll ask again if anybody has any questions, please do use that raise hand feature so that I can unmute you. Misty, this is this is Rebecca. I'd like to add something that sort of um, uh, piggybacks on my on the last question I was asked. Um, I, you know, I want I don't know if you all have seen this, but in recent weeks, 
We have seen our neighboring states like Oregon and Washington pass legislation to shore up and expand abortion access and funding, which we hope will have an impact in our region. Um, it's still important to note that not every patient will be able to travel. So this, this law is cruel, it is harmful, it will raise maternal mortality rates. We know that abortion bans do that. Um, and particularly for marginalized communities in our state, um, it, is, it is absolutely government overreach um, in its finest form, um, the governor signing this, this um, bill into law. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Nicole, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, perfect. This is uh, Nicole Camarda with Idaho News 6. Um, I'm curious if there have been any further conversations about um, if you know this this lawsuit doesn't go according to plan and the law does stay into effect. If there's been conversations about um, increasing, you know, services such as more frequency uh, or more frequent pregnancy testing or access to birth control pills um, or kind of those preventative steps. Um, if there's been any conversation about increasing that access for Idahoans. Yeah, Nicole, great question. So, you know, Planned Parenthood health centers are now more important than, than ever before. And it, as you know, it will be critical for patients to get to us for birth control visits, reproductive health care, early pregnancy testing, early access abortion care. And we want patients to establish their care early versus waiting for an emergency. So we are working now on a lot of patient facing resources and communications um, about patients ability to access um, you know, care in our health centers that, are, that is preventative. Um, in addition, we do provide telehealth. We have online birth control access through a planned parenthood app. It's called PP Direct and it is live and working in 40 states across this country uh, to do just that, to, to reach patients where they are so that they can get the needed preventive care that is absolutely critical and will always be critical for our patients. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, James, I see you again. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a follow up to my last question. Could you please be uh, more specific with the dollars that you're raising? Uh, would patients have some sort of dollar limitations attached to that uh, types of travel that would be covered hotel stays, things like that? Yeah, hi, James. So it's a good question. And I think the answer varies. Every patient's um, situation is unique. And what my job is as the CEO of this organization is to do everything possible to raise funds uh, to prevent those barriers for patients. So we have not talked about anything related to caps on support. We're, we're just, we're laser focused right now on helping our patients um, access the care that they need. So um, I, I want to ensure and do everything we can to remove every possible financial barrier for our patients who um, are, are going to need to travel out of state if they're um, past that six week mark. Yeah, thank you for that, Rebecca, and for that question, James. Um, I also wanna piggyback a little bit on the question that Nicole asked. I do think that it um, is worth noting that this legislature that passed Senate Bill 1309, on the very day that they passed it out of the house, they killed a bill that would have expanded access to birth control here in the state. So we've been working long and hard to expand access to early care, to preventive care, to things like birth control. And I think it really highlights um, the motivation behind bills like this to see that they are unwilling to pass legislation that would expand access. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands. I'll give everybody a minute to make sure.
Misty, okay. I would add that, you know, while we talk about preventive care, um, there will always need to be access to abortion care and Planned Parenthood will not stop fighting um, to, to protect and preserve uh, patients' right to body, uh, bodily autonomy and their access to abortion care. Um, so, I, you know, I just, I think it's important to note that these bans don't stop the need for abortion. They stop safe access to abortion. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Rebecca. Okay, this is your last call for questions. I'm not seeing any, so I will just thank you all again for joining us today. Um, we will have access to this recording shortly and we can follow up with any other questions or requests via email. So thank you to Rebecca and to Carrie and to all of you for joining. Thank you.